pray together. Glory to God. Father, we honor you for your faithfulness. A heart cry this afternoon is that, Lord, may the words of our mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable unto you. A prayer is that, Lord, we will serve no other God besides thee. Teach our hearts to fear you. Teach our hearts to love you. Teach our hearts to know you. Teach our hearts to be drawn much closer to you. Father, this afternoon I ask for grace that in simplicity I might share your word with your people in the mighty name of Jesus. And God's people shall say, Amen. Kindly turn with me in your Bibles to Matthew's Gospel, chapter 16. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 16. It's good to have blessing here. I can see him at the back. Glory to God. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 16. This is a very important, a very, very important passage in scriptures. In this particular passage by Revelation, Jesus was revealed to Peter as the Messiah, the son of the living God. And just after that, Jesus began talking to the disciples about his imminent death. Peter calls Jesus aside and rebukes Jesus and tells him he should not speak that way. We we'll continue the story from verse 23. Jesus turned and, sent and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. Peter is being referred to as Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of me. Then Jesus said to his disciples, after the rebuke, now he calls all the disciples, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for me will find it. What good will it be for a man if he gains the whole world and yet forfeits his own soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with his angels. And then he will reward each person according to what he has done. Amen. Beginning from today and in the coming weeks and months as a church, we will be sharing with you a subject titled Imitating Christ. I believe that the essence of our call, the essence of our lives, the essence of why you and I are alive, here, are alive today is to imitate Christ. The early church were called followers of the way because they patterned their lives after the way Jesus taught them. Before they were called Christians, they were referred to as the way. Why did they refer to them as the way? Because, simply because, the way of Christ is the way of God. The way is the only way into the holy place of God. The way of Jesus is the only truth. They were called the way because their commitment, their sacrifice to the things of God, their service, their devotion, their humility, their boldness, and their compassion. Their prayer life and their love for Jesus was such that People could not feel bad to be fascinated by their lifestyles, for they took notice that they had been with Jesus. Though most of the times such knowledge led to persecution. Today, the way of the cross has become a means of self-indulgence, greed, power, liberal Christianity, and fray. A show that has just started this autumn 
It started on the 9th of October on many TV screens in the United States of America. It's known as the Preachers of LA. And the aim of this reality show is to showcase the lavish living of some LA preachers who have become millionaires. It has been condemned by T.D. Jakes, many, many great African-American preachers, and many, many evangelicals who genuinely and passionately love Jesus. And the trailer of the preachers of LA can be found on the internet. So if you go home, all what you have to do is to Google preachers of LA. And if you want to follow what I'm saying, you can, but don't live your life that way. Today, contemporary Christianity teaches that if you are not healthy, if you are not wealthy, if you are not happy, then you do not have enough faith to appropriate what is yours. Coming to Jesus Christ to get material things is a prostitution of divine intention, says Mark Arthur, and I agree with him. It is true that when you come to Christ, he is a healer. It is true that when you come to Christ, he gives you uh, uh, and continues to bless you. But the truth is that there must be a cross before a crown. Most of the time, there is suffering before glory. And there is sacrifice before reward. This is what Jesus has called us and teaches us to follow. We are called to win by losing. If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. It is in the denial of the earthly desires that we find our fulfillment in Christ. Hallelujah. It is in the denial of the pleasures of this earth and by taking the cross upon ourselves that Jesus comes through for us. Because whoever desires through his own wisdom to save his life on this earth will lose it. What shall it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? The fact is, the truth is that we live in a world that has become very secular. A world that has become immoral, greedy, and materialistic. A world that has become very intelligent, but at the same time, very antichrist. A world that has lost its way, morally and spiritually. A world that has lost its spiritual compass. You see, the truth is that Christians may be ridiculed, but I stand here to declare boldly to you that many of them wish they have what you have. They wish they have that joy and that peace and the truth that you have because they know that money can buy joy. People are hungry for truth. And this truth is found only in Jesus the truth is that they admire your sanctity, they admire your discipline, they admire your purity, they admire your humility. And for many of them, when they are ready to marry, it is, the, it is you, the kind of woman that you are, the kind of man that you are, that they want to marry. You've got something that the world lacks. And that is called truth. And this truth is found only... You see, well, it is not about money, if it were about money, then Hollywood has arrived. If it were about money, then the billionaires of this world would have arrived. Many of them are seriously, people, people will say filthy rich, but they commit suicide. Why? They don't have the peace and the truth that you have. It is a truth that liberates. And this is what you and I have been called to follow. 2,000 years after his death, no one has come that replicates the life of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. About 12 billion people have come and gone on this planet Earth, but today, after 2,000 years after his death, no one has come close to replicating his unique place in history. 
It is said that life is a search for a voice that we can trust. Yet many lives today are rendered dysfunctional by all the voices that they hear that tries to direct, tries to counsel, and tries to control their lives. But yet, a single voice that puts all other voices into quiet perspective, a voice that settles the loudness around us and speaks peacefully, and yet clearly and confidently, is that voice that you and I can gladly follow. It is the voice of the Supreme Jesus. He says, my sheep hear my voice, and they obey me. We are called to follow his teaching and to imitate his deeds. Those that have heeded to the voice of Christ, those that have obeyed and have followed, those that have genuinely imitated, imitated him have been those that have genuinely transformed their generations for the glory of God. Those that have peace in their businesses are those that have come to make a quality decision to follow Christ. His life and teaching remain unsurpassed in its ability to guide cultures and peoples out of moral confusion. Jesus speaks to the Israelites and tells them, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. Why? Because in him was life. And that life was the light of man. And that light shines in the darkness, and the darkness cannot comprehend it. There is something about Jesus. And whoever walks with him, the darkness of this world will never be able to overcome you. You see, that word, imitator, or to imitate, comes from the Greek word mimetes. And it is out of that term that we get the word mimic, to mimic. So, it's simply someone who copies specific characteristics of another person. We are to imitate and to mimic the characteristics of Jesus. His spirit lives in us. If it's not something that we can do by our own might or by our own strength, but by the grace of the Lord, by his spirit that lives in us, we are able to mimic the essence of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You see, God's purpose in salvation is to redeem men from their sin and conform them to the image. God's plan for you is that you will be conformed into the image of his son. God's plan for you is not to make you happy, but to mature you. Because if you are mature, you will understand what it means to have a life full of joy. The difference is maturity. And not until we are conformed into the image of Christ, maturity will elude us. You see, for the parents here, one thing you will agree with me is that when your children were growing up, one of the things they loved was to imitate you. I remember my girls when they were growing up, all of them tried to imitate me. Jenny and Ruth wore my shoes. Those tiny little toes at that time found its way into my size nine shoes. And as they grew more into the shoes of their mom. They both tried to shave. Unfortunately, Ruth hurt herself with my shaving blade. I remember Jenny, anytime I came from uh, uh, the office and also when I was in college, she would run to me and bring me my slippers and take my shoe back to its place. Esther and Davina imitated my preaching <clears throat> but Ruth actually <clears throat> tried to preach like me and most of the times the other preachers she had preach. The truth is that whichever way we look at it, either we are imitating or somebody is imitating us. 
The true story is told of a dad who left his 13-year-old boy at the back of his cabin truck and made his way into a pub to have a drink. Two hours later, he came back staggering, drunk, staggering to the left and right, only to discover that his boy was missing from the car. He quickly rushed back into the bar <clears throat> at the other side of the bar to see his son in the company of two, two teenagers, true ones, who had got his son drunk and they were dancing on the floor. Angry as a dad, he attacked the boys. But the boys were stronger than dad, gave him a good beating, threw him on the floor, and fled. But while dad was bleeding on the floor, the 13-year-old boy kneels by dad and says, Daddy, I'm so sorry. It is all my fault. But daddy, I only followed you. The truth is that who is following you? Who are you following? And who should you follow? Paul writes to the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 11, 1, and he says to them, imitate me just as I imitate Christ. He writes to the Thessalonians and says, as you became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy and of the Holy Spirit, you became followers of us. In other words, they imitated Paul. He writes to his son Timothy and he says to him, son, but you have carefully followed my doctrine, my manner of life, my purpose, faith, long-suffering, love, and perseverance. So, Pastor Kingsley, what is it that we are to imitate about Jesus? One, we are to imitate his purity. Understand that despite the extreme conviction of rejection and abuse that Jesus faced, he still remained pure. Therefore, Peter encourages us to follow the example of Jesus in maintaining our purity even in the face of similar abuse. He writes to the churches in Asia Manor and says to them, 1 Peter 2, 21-23, To this you were called because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin, and no deceit was found in his mouth. When they held their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. Wow. You see, we are to keep our purity in the midst of of immense and intense persecution and provocation. You see, when we talk about purity, purity is not only living a holy life, but purity is about the condition of your heart. If the heart is right, then whatever you do shall be right. If the inner man is right, whatever, if he is pure, whatever you do shall be pure. You see, in life, what comes out of you under pressure is who you are. Praise the Lord. If you press grapes very hard, what will come out of the grapes? What will you get? Grape juice. You will not get mango juice. You will get grape juice because that is what is in the grape. If I dip my handkerchief right now in the water and I press it, what will come out of it? Water. So it is. So for you and I, under pressure, what comes out of us is what is in us. Are you hearing me? And the Bible says that when Jesus was reviled, when he, they held insults at him on the cross, he did not retaliate. Wow. You see, if somebody insults you, the natural and the easiest thing for you, which demands no effort, is to let him know you are not stupid and to reply back. Insults for you. You do me, I do you. But for somebody to insult you and for you to hold your peace and to reply maturely and not in anger is a sign 
of a child of God who imitates his master. The natural thing is, you insult me, why not? You see, God looks at the heart and blesses our actions. He is more interested in the motives than in the actions. Because actions can be deceptive. But under pressure, what will come out of you is who you are. And, and this afternoon, we are being told to become imitators of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. When they insulted him, he made no threats. Today, people will just curse back. We are called to imitate our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To imitate Christ is to allow Jesus to live his perfect will through us by living a life of obedience, by depending on him, by spending time with him in prayer, by learning about him in the scriptures. The more we do that, before you become aware, you will be imitating. I have discovered, even at the age of 61, that I wake up most mornings with the gospel music I listened before I went to bed. I wake up singing it. It's become part of my life. So the things you spend time for, the things you imitate, you see, the more you look into the mirror when you are dressing up, the more you make yourself to appear good. That is when you will know where the foundation and the concealer must go. How much of the lipo lipo you need. Where the mascara must go. And where to place the lipstick at the right position. So the more, and the Bible says, the more we look into the mirror of the word of God. And the word of God is like a mirror. So the more you look into it, the more you are transformed into the image of Christ from glory unto glory. You see, the more you look into the word, your image changes and you are changing from one glory unto another glory. 2 Corinthians 3.18 tells us. Then James also writes in James 1, 23 to 24, and says that if we look into the mirror and we are not doers of the word, then if we read the word and we are not doers of the word, we look, we become like somebody who looks into the mirror, so that his tie was not well positioned, but just walks away and says, I don't care. I don't think there is any woman in the world who out of hurry just takes a lipstick. There is no mirror because she's uh, in a hurry and tries to uh, when you, when you put the, 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 the lipstick on your mouth, what are you doing? How do you call it? You are wearing lipstick. Okay. Okay, I take your word. Whatever, huh? You are applying lipstick. Oh, good. So in your attempt to apply the, or to wear whatever, the lipstick, the lipo lipo, and you are in a hurry, so you took it, and unknowingly to you, you painted the top of your lips. Then just when you are about to walk out, you, did, you just peeped through the mirror but, and discovered the lipstick. There is no way you walk out. The car can go. Because as an honorable woman, you will wait. And take your time and wear that lipstick properly. That is how the word of God is. The more you look into the word, which is a mirror, the more you know what to change, what to stop, what not to do, how to speak, and how to act. Praise the Lord. And to imitate Jesus, to be able, you see, on your own you can't. But the more that you look into that word, into that mirror, and that mirror will expose everything that is hidden in your life. It will tell you, you see, my prayer for every church member of TPC is that when you take your Bible to read, this book is a revelation. 
And when Paul prayed for the Ephesians, his prayer was that God might grant unto them the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him. My prayer is that any time you take this Bible to read, may you hear the voice of God. Because when revelation comes to you, you are hearing his voice. And that voice will tell you that is not the way to treat your life, your wife. That voice will tell you, that the word will tell you, you must season your words with salt. The word will tell you, don't reply back, don't face anger with anger. The Bible will tell you, a soft answer turns away rough. And the more you follow that and obey that, what you, you unknowingly to you, you are imitating Jesus and you are becoming like him. And before you become aware, you go to any place, you go to a place where there is profanity, everybody keeps quiet because the pastor has come. You don't have to be a pastor to be called a pastor. Are you hearing me? When you are a true imitator of Christ, nobody tells you, the world knows because you are the only Bible they are reading. And they know the truth, but they don't have it. But they know you have it. So any moment you go there, everything there changes. There is a place I love going to. I have only one Baba. And I like the way he cuts my hair. Because he cuts it the way I want it. <laughs> and that is very, very important to me. I don't want to go to a Baba who will tell me because of the shape of your head, I should, no, no, cut it the way I want it. So he can say, enough, yeah, yeah. That's, that's my own hair. My brother, when he was young, he went to a barber. And the barber cut his hair the wrong way. So, after that, he looked into the mirror. You know, it depends where you are cutting your hair. Then he started crying and told the barber, put my hair back. <laughs> oh, mercy. Mercy. You see, the more you spend more time in the word, the more you spend more time with Jesus, not only will your life change, but if you fail to do that, then you will see that the life you will live will be a life which will be defeated by sinful habits because only imitating Christ and studying the word can your habits change. And you see, anything you do daily becomes a habit for you. So if you make it your habit to study God's word daily, before you become aware, you'll be imitating him. You'll be talking scriptures, you'll be reacting scriptures, you'll be acting like Christ, and people will be calling you, Osofo, the minister. And that is the fact. And I'm praying that we'll become a child that imitates Christ. That way, even when they, they, they rain insults at you, when the enemy touches and attacks your body, you know it is temporal. Glory to God. You know it is a light affliction. And that your God is a healer in the name of Jesus. If you don't, then you'll be preoccupied with a list of do's and don'ts. Christianity is not do's and don'ts. Christianity is a life of yielding to the Holy Spirit. And I have... Ever since I came to know Christ, since 77, when I completed writing my A-level exams, one thing I've come to realize is that God is faithful. And I have never seen this God disappoint me. And it affirmed the words of David when he said, I was young and now I am old. I have never seen the righteous forsaken, nor the seed of the righteous going about and begging for bread. You see, God will not ruin his reputation. He will not use you as an experiment to break his word on you. He defends his own. Glory to God. You see, life is not measured by the volume of money that you have. Life is measured by contentment. I know people who literally have no income. Then the little that friends are giving them for now, but their lives are happier. Their lives are fulfilled and they are always thanking God because they know it is temporary. But 
As I said earlier on, there are people who have millions, but they are committing suicide. That is the difference. It is called contentment. And you can never be content if Christ is not the center of your life. If you don't spend time in the word, you'll be exhausted by busy self-effort. You'll be frustrated by a sense of distance from God and will be trapped by worldliness. So what are we to imitate exactly? Kindly turn with me in your Bible to Romans chapter 12. Let's just read, read some scriptures. Things that a good imitator of Christ can do, must do, and will happen in your life. You let me read it. Let, listen to me. Let me read it. I'm reading from the NIV. Paul writes to the Romans and he says, Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. In other words, if you cling or hold on to anything, hold on to what is good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. It must be a genuine devotion. Honor one another above yourselves. Don't only associate with your class. Associate with others who are not as privileged as you. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with God's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. You can't be a Christian and be wicked. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. You want to imitate Christ? Don't curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. When people are mourning, when people are going through challenges, don't sit somewhere and say their sense has found them out. That is not coming from a heart that is pure. Is somebody with me today? This is scripture. Live in harmony with one another. You cannot live a life of purity. You cannot live a life that imitates Christ and you don't talk to somebody. I thank God that at TBC, nobody is at loggerheads with anybody. Do not be proud because pride goes before a fall. Be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be considered. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. You do me, I do you. No. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everybody. Don't be a man pleaser, but do what is right. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. This is practical Christianity. And these are things you can do. Do not take revenge, my friends, but leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him drink. In doing this, you will keep burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Wow. May that be a lot in the name of Jesus. Oh, I didn't hear you. I said, may this be a lot in the name of Jesus. We are to imitate his purity, but finally, we are also to imitate his mercy. And this is so important to me. You see, the merciful are full of compassion and pity towards those who are suffering, either because of their sin or sorrow. You see, anything we do in this world has a consequence. And the truth about sin is that it has a consequence. But when somebody does something and the consequence comes on that person, your duty as a child of God is to have compassion on that person and to help that person out of that predicament. But not to rejoice over what has happened. Are you with me? One thing that mercy does is that mercy gives people a second chance. John records a story in John's Gospel chapter 8. A woman who was brought to Jesus. And when they brought her, they said, Lord, Master, this one, we caught her in the act. 
And they went on and said, In the law of Moses, Moses in the law commanded us, John 8 verse 5, that such one should be stoned. What do you say? Jesus said nothing. Because he knew what was in them. And you see, God looks at the heart. God looks at the inside, not on the outside. Self-righteousness will make people try to judge others, hiding what is in them. Jesus just wrote in the sand. And after some moments, he raised his head and said, He that is without sin, cast the first stone. And the Bible says that from the eldest to the youngest, they all left. And it was left with Jesus and the woman alone. Jesus looked at the woman and said, Where are your accusers? Neither do I condemn thee, but go and sin no more. And you see, the difference is that Jesus did not condone the sin, but did not leave the woman the same. Go and sin no more. You see, you have what the world needs. You have what the struggling Christian needs. You have mercy. You have truth. And the grace of the Lord is over your life. So when your brother or sister falls, yours is not to step on him and damage him, but yours is to lift him up. Did you know that in life, to keep somebody down and for you to, you see, if you compare yourself with other people, then the truth is that you will see how righteous you are. But that is not how God looks at it. And at times to keep somebody down, or to keep somebody down, what you have to do is to make sure you are also stationary and you step on that person. So your focus and your attention is always on that person. Why? Because if you leave, that person will get up. But if somebody falls and you give that person a hand to rise up again, who, who rises first? You. So as you help others to rise, the glory of the Lord comes over you and you are promoted more. And by doing so, you are also lifting somebody up. And that is all what mercy is about. Mercy is about not giving people what they deserve. But instead of giving them what they deserve, God gave us grace, what we don't deserve. That is the difference between grace and mercy. And you and I are called to imitate the mercy of Jesus. Jesus enters into Jericho. And when we went into Jer when we went to Jerusalem, we went to Jericho and we were shown the sacrament three. Luke's gospel records for us and says that Zacchaeus on that tree, when Zacchaeus heard that Jesus was coming, he wanted to meet him. But Zacchaeus was such a wicked tax collector, taking taxes from where he, so the people hated him. So he climbed the tree, also because of his stature. He was a short man, the Bible says. Then the Bible says, when Jesus got to the tree, he said, he knows you by name. He knows what is in your heart. And he, let's read that. Luke chapter 19. Let's read it. I think it's better we read. Luke 19. The Bible says Jesus entered Jericho from verse 1 and was passing through. A man was there by name. You are there, Luke chapter 19. A man was there by, by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. He has taken what doesn't belong to him. He wanted to see who Jesus was. But being a short man, he could not because of the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him. Since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down and at once, at once and welcomed him gladly. And all, all the people saw this and began to matter. And this is what happens in our world today. To remember, he has gone to be the guest of a what? Of a sinner. They've judged him. And the truth is that people know they are sinners, but they can't help themselves. 
That is why God has given you his spirit. Is somebody hearing me today? You see, the drunkard will tell you, as for me, I, I know I'm a drunkard. But, but you, you say you are a Christian, look at you. And, and, and drunkards are such that when they, they drink, but they don't drink their mind. I'm telling you, they don't drink their mind in the alcohol. They still have their senses. And most of the things they say when they are drunk, most of them are true. Especially when they decide to address and to insult. <laughs> when they drink, all the things they know comes into memory. Especially we the Christians. Say, so you, you look at you. I mean, I know, I know I'm not a Christian. I'm drunk by you. You say you are a Christian. Yesterday you did that. The other day you did that. Always you are judging me. Me, I will go to heaven. You, you won't go. And at times they begin to tell you Bible stories. Because me I have prayed. Like the woman with the, with, with the widow's mind. I have said, Jesus, have mercy on me, a sinner. <laughs> and I will go, you. You say you are a Christian, you do this. You do, and they will, lie, they will number it for you. Show mercy. You see, we are too judgmental and unloving at times. The truth about mercy is that mercy triumphs over judgment. Judgment has no power than to condemn. But mercy has power to transform. The disciples of Jesus are the askers of Samaria go to buy fruit. And Jesus talks to the Samaritan woman. And when they came and they saw Jesus talking to the woman, John's Gospel 4, 27 says, and at this point his disciples came and they marveled that he talked to the woman, yet no one said, what do you seek? Or why are you talking with her? Only heavens know what the disciples were thinking. Even though they knew the purity of Jesus. The essence of Jesus is that he made it quite clear that they that are whole needs not a physician. I came not for the righteous, but sinners unto repentance. If Jesus were to put the measuring rod of sin at this door, many of us will have to fly to get out of this place. But it is mercy that has kept us. You see, it is very easy to play God when one sins and find him and expose him and use him to accomplish our own righteousness. I believe that the time has come for TBC and for the church of the living God to imitate Jesus and his mercy because there are people who are lost and what they need is love and encouragement. Let them know that your Jesus is merciful and that he works. A true story. At a reception. A wedding reception. A pastor. Decides. For the first time. To go to a wedding reception. Then a bloke comes. Who is not a believer. He goes into the pub. And buys two jacks of beer. Puts one in front of the pastor. And starts to gulp his own. The pastor says nothing. The beer is just sitting in front of him. One of the deaconesses walks in late to the reception. Sees the beer in front of the pastor. She walks out of the reception, never comes to the church again. Has seriously checked the pastor. I cannot sit under a pastor who drinks publicly. He has disgraced me. But the pastor was not drinking. The pastor did not buy the beer. Somebody just put it there. And all this while the pastor took his time and was talking, oh, you see, you, he went for the second, the guy went for the third, but the pastor's beer was still there. And the pastor took his time, spoke to this man, gave him his number, then he kept visiting him. Three months after, the man became a believer simply because of the mercy that the pastor shown to him when he saw his lifestyle. Then when the issue of the deaconess was reported to him. 
he says, I will, I will choose to hang up with these drunkards who need Christ than somebody who thinks they are righteous. Yeah. Hallelujah. The truth is that at times we are afraid we'll be viewed as condoning sin. At times we are interested in the money that people give but not in the people. A true story and I was if you have read your word the word for today you would have seen it. A true story. A, a believer who supports two pastors, TV pastors and decided finally to go and visit their churches. Went to the first church. Pre, the pastor preached a very good sermon. After that, wanted to see the pastor to say, hey, you can't. You can't. You have to phone the office and make an appointment. So disappointed and feeling rejected, he leaves. The second Sunday goes to the church of the other pastor. After the service wants to see the pastor, why not? Sees the pastor, the pastor, hey, can we have lunch together with your family? They go to lunch together. The man brings out a check and writes a check of $4 million to support his ministry. May the Lord so much bless you. Glory to God. And this is a true story. You know, and at times, if you are not careful, as a pastor, you will love the money but not the giver. If you are not careful, you will love the crowd but not the people. But you see, the truth about life, people are not interested in how much you know than as to how much you love. Is somebody hearing me today? I was telling the first service again, God has supernaturally caused TBC Accra to be one of the largest churches in the city. Massive church. Thousands. And we have one of the best protocols in the city. And I'm talking about real protocol. Army officers, police officers, top businessmen. And when they are coming, you know men are coming. You know, like uh, like Lord and, and uh, Uncle George Apia. You know that men are coming and John. Men! Men! This one real? And when... The, Anytime they are ushering me in, because it's a big church and they, they are pushing people. Ah, they did that at first. I didn't understand why they were doing that. <laughs> then the second day, I shouted, hey! Stop! I will wait. Let them sit down. And if they sit down, I will walk in. Why should you push? Because Pastor K is coming. And the truth is that Becoming that way is very easy. You are sitting there, you're saying, mm, you get to that position. <laughs> well, you are coming and there are five people here, there are six people here, and they are making way for you to. If you are not careful, you will become self-deceived. But we are called not only to love people, but also to show them mercy. The truth about love is that Love is powerful than hate. Light is powerful than darkness. And the love and the light of God lives in you. You see, let, let us stop looking outside and see people through the merciful eyes of Jesus. Is somebody with me today? When people offend you, find a reason to forgive them. Jesus on the cross found a reason to forgive those who crucified him. He said, Father, forgive them. Why? For they, they know not what they are. That was a reason for God to forgive them. And on the sand that on the cross, anything that Jesus said, the Father would do it. But he gave God a reason. You and I must find a reason to forgive people. Hallelujah. Amen. At times, we are too self-righteous. William Booth, William Booth, sorry, the founder of the Salvation Army. One Sunday walking in London with his son, uh, Bramwell Booth, who was 13 years old, the father surprised the son by taking him into a pub. Right. 
The place was crowded with men and women, many of them bearing on their faces the marks of crime. They were drunk. They were misbehaving. The fumes of alcohol and tobacco were poisonous and choking. William Booth said to his 13-year-old son, Bramwell, these are the people I want you to live for and bring to Christ when you grow up. Bramwell writes years after that and says, when you grew up, the impression never left me. You see, not until you are merciful to the sufferings and the strugglings of people, you will not help anybody. Because you will look at them and say, it's their sin, and, and you look at your own self-righteousness and become justified. If we are to imitate Jesus, we are to become merciful. You see, it is very easy to compare ourselves with sinners. But the Lord says that we dare not class ourselves or compare ourselves with those who commend themselves. But they, measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves by themselves are not wise. If I feel I'm more successful or a better believer because compared to you I look great, then I'm likely not to help you when you fall. But when I see that you are struggling in your faith eh, and you triple and are merciful, I will come to your aid. Is somebody hearing me today? At times people who are judgmental often have problems themselves. Thomas Akampis wrote a very important, he, he has written one of the best books on the imitation of Christ and I highly recommend everybody buys that book. He says, let me quote a portion of that book for you. He says, do not think yourself better than others. Lest perhaps you become accounted worse before God who knows what is inside people. Do not take pride in your good deeds for God's judgment differ from human judgment. What pleases people often displeases God. If there is good in you, you will see good in people. You see, mercy saw beyond the murder that was in, mess, uh, in Moses, mercy saw a deliverer of God's people. Mercy saw beyond the adultery that was in David, and mercy saw a great king and a psalmist. Mercy saw beyond the murder that was in Paul, in Paul the murderer attitude that was in Paul, and saw a great apostle to the Gentiles. Mercy saw beyond the abrasiveness in Peter, and saw a leader of the early church. You see, for you and I, mercy saw beyond our drinking, our immorality, the number of abortions, the excessive anger, the pride, and mercy saw the pastors that were in us. Mercy saw the church leaders that were in us. Mercy saw the, the, the reporters that were in us. Mercy saw the businessmen that were in us. Mercy saw the quality that is in us. And mercy reached us and picked us from the dandrums of the pit and has set us on the rock to stay. We are to show mercy to others. We are to show mercy to others. You see, the closer you are to Christ, the more you see yourself as you really are. Because compared to the righteousness of Christ, you will see and your son will be more of you. Let me end by saying this. The only institution the devil has no control over is the church. Are you hearing me? So he attacks the church from within and from without. The Bible tells us that he is the prince of the power of this air. The Bible tells us that he holds the whole earth in sway. The Bible tells us he is the God of this earth, but not over the church. Because Jesus says, I'm building my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail. So the devil has no control over the church. That is why he attacks the church. From within and from without, making church members do what they shouldn't do. But you know what? He has no control. You see, the church is not a museum for saints. The church is a hospital. And when your brother makes a mistake, 
I'm not condoning and I will never condone, say God forbid. But when somebody sins, those of us that are strong are to lift that person up so that the enemy will not steal him. Listen, when one American pilot was shot down by Yugoslavia during the Bosnia war, America spent $17.5 million, 25 elite soldiers to rescue him. One person. But we, when our people fall, we destroy them. Is somebody hearing me? We are to imitate Jesus. Jesus left the hundred and went after the one sheep that was lost. And if we are to imitate Jesus, that is the kind of last time we are to live. God has not called us to judge one another, but to walk in life, in love, and to have a heart of purity. You see, the church is like Noah's ark. Outside that ark, are the storms. And when that storm begins to blow, the speed is about 120 miles per hour. Very destructive. You saw what the 80 miles per hour did into our nation last week. That is how outside the ark is. But you see, inside the ark is a smell. It stinks. And at times, inside the church, because people are in the church, some of the things they do stinks. And, and, but the truth is that wherever there are people, there are problems. And the devil knows he has no control over the church of the living God. The church has its weaknesses, but it has no rival. It is the only institution that has salt. Because the people of the kingdom make up the church. It is the only institution that has sought to season the decay and the rot in our world and to preserve it. It is only the church that has light to repel the darkness in the world. That is why the devil attacks it from center, left, and right. But you and I are called to understand that God has called us as ambassadors. And as ambassadors, we are to represent him well on this earth. And he makes his appeal through us. That through our lives, the world must be reconciled back unto him. And I plead with us today. Let us imitate Jesus. To live a life of purity. And to live a life of mercy. And I stand here to, to declare that as we do this, not only will we see the hand of the Lord powerful over our lives, but mercy will overshadow us. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Will overshadow us. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. With every head bowed,